right. Well, welcome again to Signs of Destiny 2003 here in Tempe, Arizona, and it's my great privilege to introduce a man who really needs very little introduction because his books speak for him, and the extraordinary uh, scholarly research, carefully done, um, meticulously done, I would say, and for the wonderful connections that he has, and also I think his great skill as a writer. For someone who has written, I know how hard that is to translate what are an extraordinary and amazing number of facts and to bring them together into a coherent and cogent and not only that but very readable uh, and enjoyable form of uh, literature. And so, so Lawrence Gardner is with us tonight from England and it's really my extraordinary pleasure to have him. We wanted to have him back in 2001 and everything fell apart and this year, by goodness, he is with us. I got lots of phone calls asking me, is Sir Lawrence coming? Is he really coming? Well, yes, he is in the room. And so without further ado, I want to introduce to you right from England, Sir Lawrence Gardner. Is that what you're looking for? Well, while we're looking for the remote control, good evening. Um, thanks for the welcome. I uh, didn't make it the last time, as Chet mentioned, and in fact the time before that that I was due to, to make an appearance was, was the 9-11 thing, so uh, everything fell apart then as well. But obviously it was waiting for Tempe. Um, science is, is moving forward now at really quite an incredible rate. I mean, lots of people will be talking about that here this year. And in fact, the last two or three years has made an extraordinary difference to the way that this thing is snowballing. Even the most notable researchers, the most academic and frontline scientists, people like Stephen Hawking in Britain, uh, our astronomer royal, even Sir Martin Rees, are, are sounding now more like science fiction writers than, than academic scientists. Um, they have a problem because the, 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 the trouble that they have is that they're now trying to describe to the public on radio and TV and whatever all sorts of things that they're actually finding it quite tough to find a language to, to, to describe. Um, the, the problem is that, that there is an element, and it's an element that unfortunately exists in the media still, in that there are, are those that are, are, are thinking now that even the scientists are, are sounding preposterous. <laughs> and. Um, that's really quite good because there was a dividing line, I suppose, between philosophers and people like us and scientists, but now they've, they've, they've joined our club. They're, 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 they're preposterous as well. But what it's about, it's actually about limiting the learning curve. It's about the fact that the establishment generally gears us to believing that going through an academic course taking an examination, getting a qualification, gets us to where we're going. And, and, and there's very little other place to go following that. Well, that isn't the case. But very many of the people who, who, who edit scientific magazines and who, who, who write in newspapers and who do uh, interviews for the media are actually locked into that little time warp. It's taken them a while to, <coughs> to climb out of it. Anyway, it, it really, we can look back over the last century, back to the days of Albert Einstein in particular. We can look at the DNA revelations of, of Crick and Watson. And, and throughout the, the, the sort of latter part of, of, of the 20th century, scientists have been talking about a holy grail of physics. They're using the words, the holy grail, the ultimate quest of physics. And they've been looking for the unified or universal theory of everything. Now that's a pretty tall order. That's like the meaning of life. You know, what, what is this discovery? What is this one thing that we're going to find that will give us the meaning <coughs> of everything? Well, I mean, clearly that, that, that there isn't any one thing that, that, that will be the answer to that. But there's a lot of little things that are falling into place that are gradually building up this picture. And the picture seems to be emerging in as much as that to find the answers to the biggest problems 
they're looking smaller and smaller and smaller. They're actually looking to find universal answers by studying nuclei, electrons, quarks, tiny, tiny things. So it's a real microcosm, macrocosm um, game that's going on here now. In the course of this, you know, words like quarks, words like superconductivity, superstrings, all, all of this wonderful new vocabulary has emerged. And in, it, for the most part, it's, it, it's quite a descriptive vocabulary, but it doesn't mean a lot to people at large when suddenly these words are blurted out on the radio by, by some scientists. So that they're actually trying to find ways now to turn it into fairly simple language. Um, unfortunately, I, I've been picked on by, by a few scientific institutes who are now just sending me information. And, and, and I mean, not that I'm a qualified scientist, I'm, I'm certainly not, I'm not a doctor or whatever, but, you know, I, I, I do have an ability to be more simplistic with language than they are. And I guess they figure that if Gardner is going to be talking about this anyway, we may as well make sure that he's got the right material at hand. So, you know, so I get sent this stuff and, um, you know, some of it is very, very complicated physics. You know, I mean, it's, um, I, I get sent equations and, and things that blow my mind. But, but in fact, the job that I have is exactly that. How to turn this into language, how to just make it seem like straightforward talk. Um, I've, got, I've got various friends out there who, who help me to uh, transcribe and transpose things and, and, and who can actually lead me down a path into even understanding the things that uh, I, I'm unsure about. Um, Daniel, Daniel Ward, who's here today, has been a great um, help to me in, in, in that from, uh, from Fort Collins in, in Colorado and, and, and other friends like that have helped me. So, although I'm not a scientist, I, I really have around me some, some really good backup. And so I'm, I'm very confident that when I finally write, put something to paper, it's, it, it's accurate and it's good stuff. Space-time, they say, can now be manipulated. Gravity-resistant material is heralded and being worked on now for air transport. Virtual sciences are becoming a reality. You can imagine that because um, that really is a contradiction. If it's virtual, it's not real, but virtual science is becoming a reality and we're beginning to get an understanding now of hyperdimensional environments. This is interesting because, you know, in, in the more esoteric world, there's always been an understanding of hyperdimensional environments. They're called astral planes or, or whatever else, whatever other terminology one might put on them, but it's never been a difficult concept to understand. These preposterous scientists are now talking about them. And they're talking about them in such an amazing way that on British television last week there was a debate about how many of these other realms there were. Were there 10? Were there 11? One scientist reckons there's 26. Are they even discussing these and describing um, uh, the, the, their discoveries? You know, where are they? What are they? How do we get to them? If we do, how do we get back? All these questions that nobody knows. But the most amazing thing is the acknowledgement of the fact. No matter how little they might know, they're acknowledging that parallel universes, as they seem to prefer to call them, exist. Whether they're a millimeter away from us, whether they're screwed up and locked in some little superstring somewhere, doesn't seem to matter. We are dealing in a world now where we know that our three spatial dimensions and our fourth one of time are not the beginning and end of anything. In fact, they might just be the beginning of it as far as we're concerned, but this is snowballing very quickly. And we're going to move into these things, I think over the next four or five years, at, at quite an extraordinary rate now. Um, I, I, I guess the big prize is going to be who, who's going to be the first person to dive into a superstring and uh, want to take the risk. Can we get back? One of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight, I think, which will make a focus of, of what we're talking about, is, is th these substances that I've written about over the last few years, and specifically in this book, these things which are called asymmetrically deformed high-spin elements, or as they've been 
termed orbitally rearranged monatomic elements or, or, or whatever. Now for those who, come on, it's got to work here. I'll get it. No, I won't. <laughs> hey, maybe it's better from where you were, will you? That's, that's forward, that's amazing. No? Oh, okay. You've got the touch. Can you, can you be my assistant and we'll do some tricks? Yeah, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Just forward. <laughs> forward. Oh, that one right there. Yeah. Okay, I've got it now. Thank you. Okay, my, my props men have sorted me out all around. <laughs> the microphone's working. For those of you that didn't hear what I spoke about, I'll um, <laughs> do it again on Monday. <laughs> okay, now here we go. This is going to be it. <laughs> hey! Except it wasn't where I wanted to go. Okay, well it doesn't matter. We'll get to we'll get to that one. Pardon? Yeah, the the powder one. I want William, wherever that is. You can tell this is the beginning of a conference. This is the way things start off. But okay, should be the next one. No, that's it. Hey, okay, that's the stuff we're talking about. After all that, it's very boring, isn't it? It's white powder. <laughs> it's white powder, which could be anything. Um, that, that particular sample um, is a sister sample of one that I used to carry around with me. In fact, I always do in Britain. Um, my, my sample looks exactly like that. It was made over here a few years ago from um, a Canadian maple leaf coin, 24 karat gold. Um, it, the, the powder is obtained by simply surprising the metals in one way or another. Shock, shocking gold or, or platinum group metals it can be done with into a state where the atoms forget that they're supposed to be metal. The bonds between the atoms fall apart and a powder um, simply forms. Um, so th th these grains of powder are really clusters of, of single atoms, are little clusters of atoms of, of what were gold. But it now doesn't analyze as gold, it analyzes as something completely different. Um, this, as we'll, we'll get into, has an astonishing past. It, it was a food ingested by the kings back in old Mesopotamia and Egypt and whatever, and we'll discuss that the reason that I have this photograph that is so difficult to find on here then can't bring my sample it, because the last time I had my sample here in America, I missed my plane on the way back because they locked me up. Um, they, uh, I, I'd put this stuff, for, I'd come straight from the lab and I'd just pop this powder into a twist of aluminum foil and popped it in my pocket and didn't think too much about it. And uh, it, I bleeped, of course, in the thing and they said, what, the, what on earth is that? And I said, well, nothing, I've taken everything out of my pocket except this, um, <laughs> this, and so they said, what is it? And I said, well, it, it, it's, a, it's a monatomic superconductive anti-gravitational substance, <laughs> um, which, uh, which used to be used for feeding the light bodies of Babylonian kings. <laughs> I wasn't really joking, I was telling the truth, but you, you don't tell the truth to customs people, do you? They, they took me away. I told, I told them that actually, according to all the ancient texts, that it had anti-aging properties. And um, I, I guess they took it for their dogs to sniff or whatever, but the dogs came back looking the same age as they were to start with, so... It obviously wasn't much good, this stuff. But anyway, I missed the plane and, and now I don't carry it um, back and forth to America. I, I, I leave it at home and um, bring a photograph. <laughs> so that's the stuff. Anyway, back in 1999, in Genesis of the Grail Kings, well, I, I, was just, I introduced this stuff on, on the back really of some research that had happened here, right here in, in Arizona, in this very region. 
And I talked about it, I'd introduced it into my work because I felt it was important, it was going to be very important. And I remarked that it, it probably wouldn't be very long. This is in March 99, the book's published. And I, I said, I didn't think it would be very long before um, scientists were talking about this stuff for, for clean energy provision, things like that. Certainly, I, I, I said it would move into the field of medical treatment because these elements have really quite astonishing properties. And um, they would even supersede fossil fuels, I dared to suggest. And, um, well, I mean, that was before the scientists became preposterous, so I was on my own at that time, really. But it wasn't that long. It took a year and a half. October the 1st, 2000, and there it was. Headlines in the British National Pr Press. Well, it wasn't front page headlines, but it was a big double feature inside. Um, gold and platinum group elements will be the answer to clean energy provision and cancer treatment. Very interesting, just really what we've been talking about. They got in there this, this guy called um, Barry Davison. He, he was the chairman, the, the, the sort of head honcho of the Anglo-American Platinum Corporation. This is a five-company corporation of British and American companies who, who have got the platinum mines in, in South Africa. And he said the long-term demand for these metals for fuel cell technology is astounding. That was his words. <clears throat> well, it seemed to me pretty clear then why this corporation had been formed, why the British and American companies had got together, and why they were suddenly buying up, by force if necessary, it seemed, all the South African mines that were native-owned at that time that they hadn't had their hands on before. The West was getting its hands on the new source substance, these, these noble metals. Graham Titcomb came along into the article. He's the... Um, a group managing director of Johnson Maffey. They're the precious metals dealers and world market um, dictators, really. Again, he said the same thing. The demand that will come from this market is huge. There were comments in there from motor companies like Ford, BMW, Mercedes, um, uh, aircraft companies were, were there, and they were all saying the same thing. This is the way science will go. Now, they weren't using the words monatomic or anything like that. They were just talking about gold and platinum group elements. But the moment they're talking about elements rather than metals, it's pretty obvious that they're thinking of the atomic state of these metals. Um, then the World Gold Council came on the scene. That, that was quite interesting because I'd been talking to the World Gold Council about this and they had denied all knowledge of, 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 of magical substances coming from these metals. And then suddenly, quite suddenly, and this was oh, only about two years ago, uh, they, they suddenly announced in their official literature, I'll give you the wording, gold is moving center stage in the fields of clean energy provision and cancer research. No messing. Well, we then had this situation where from 1999 in the summer, Britain and, and, and about 15 other countries all, all linked up through with IMF approval and started to sell off gold reserves. That was an interesting departure. Been very important to us for two or three hundred years, gold. We dig it up out of the ground and we melt it into gold bars and we bury it under the ground again. <laughs> And it supports our currencies. Doesn't matter whether we're in America here or in Britain or wherever, it's become a major way of doing things. And it's a rather odd thing if you think about it. Gold is heavy, gold is bulky, it takes up a lot of space, it's difficult to move, it's not the rarest of materials, and yet it was selected. You know, a bag of diamonds might do as good a job as a whole room full of gold if it's just underpinning currencies. Anyway, gold is what we latched onto, without necessarily knowing why, except that we've always known, always, as a, as a race of, of humans, that gold is important. It's the warmest, friendliest of all the metals. We've always loved it. And it became the underpinner. But we didn't know maybe why it was so special. We just knew that it was. So, the, the bullion sales begin. 
Britain is very, very upfront about it. So are a number of company, uh, other countries. America is a little shy in talking about it, so it does its deals in a slightly different way. But, but Britain now has less than half of the gold reserves that it had three years ago. Less than half. And um, when one asks them who's buying it, they won't say. Now one can go to art auctions, antique auctions, I mean any sort of auctions and discover who's bought what. This is actually a public resource, belongs to the, the people of nations and yet we're not allowed to know who's buying it, it's a secret. So I, it just occurred to me that clearly, clearly there was some knowledge here. It wasn't just about selling gold, it was about selling gold for a particular purpose. It was about selling gold to people or corporations probably, I figured perhaps the oil and the drug industries were, were, were getting into this. Um, and I, I, I thought, well, you know, they obviously know why they're buying it. They're buying gold at a level that they've never bought it before. Every day before the auctions, the price would go down. They would do their buying at a cheap rate, and every day after the auctions, the price would go up. Well, it actually took me a long, long time to, to get to the bottom of, of, of the, the documentation. And I'll show these documents on, on Monday, but I finally got to it. And, and even in America here, the um, Securities and Exchange Commission, Washington, D.C., their prospectuses for gold sales now include the words that this is the material for future energy provision, clean energy, environment-friendly fuel cells, and cancer treatment. So there's no messing from anybody now. It's quite up front. It just isn't hitting the media, but it's hitting those who are trading. Um, why are you selling the gold, I ask? And they say, we're not selling it, we're swapping it. Um, okay, what are you swapping it for? Other currencies. Uh, isn't that called selling? <laughs> uh, yes, but we're calling it swapping. Okay. So we now find that, that in Britain, for example, that, that sterling, which is a pretty stable currency, is now underpinned 75%, uh, 75 of the 50% that we've lost is underpinned by euros, which is a very unstable currency. So it really means that we're underpinned by nothing. And this is going to happen throughout the, the West. Um, the, the whole concept in our minds will be changed about underpinning currencies. And probably in the end what will happen is the currencies themselves will disappear and it will all become plastic and <coughs> the world of monetary dealing will change. Anyway, this stuff is not a new discovery. It was written about, it was known about in the most ancient of times. My badge has collapsed another of the props. <laughs> uh, this is a, a strange theatre. Anyway, I, I know who I am. So it's, uh, if this works again, we've got a... <laughs> oh look, look, come on, why won't you? So, I've got a wonderful lot of pictures here. Look. I cannot you get this to go. Yeah, but it's not doing anything. Okay, that's great. Thank you, William. William, I'm going to say. I'm going to say next slide, William. Okay, what the heck's that? Oh yeah. Moses, Pharaoh's sacred powder, Ark of the Covenant, tons and tons of writings about all of these things linked together from from olden times. The powder of projection, they called it. Powder of projection. The um, Mesopotamians called it very specifically Shemana. Shemana, 
Anna, they called it, meant firestone. Shamana meant highwood, firestone. Um, those of you who, who, who read Sitchin or, or have read Zechariah Sitchin will know about the word Shem, which he describes as, as um, a sort of a conical um, thing. It, it, it actually stems from the word high or high word, something that goes upwards. This stuff goes upwards. It's high wood, fire, stone. The Egyptians called it Mufkut, a very strange word that, that um, translates from hieroglyphs with no vowels, whatever. So we've no idea how to pronounce it, Mufkut. At all stages of history, at all stages of its writing, this stuff was meant to have amazing powers. Teleportation, transmutation, levitation, all of those magical things that were so much a part of, of, of the sort of hidden background in, in biblical lore and, and old texts. Things that we never really understood. Well, we're beginning to understand them now because the, these elements are becoming known to us. And, and so the writings are beginning to make sense. It's rather like not blaming great granddad for, for, for misunderstanding certain Bible references when in fact the documents that explain them to us weren't discovered, let's say, until 30 or 40 years ago. The science is evolving now quite naturally. And suddenly we're discovering that what's new is also ancient. These technologies, the knowledge of these things was around a long, long time ago. In the, the, today's world, the Institute for Advanced Studies in, in um, Texas has described such materials as this as exotic matter. They can't put another name on them, exotic matter. Um, superconductivity, that's one of its primary characteristics, which we'll talk about in a, f a few minutes. Uh, claimed by the Center for, for Advanced Study in Illinois as the most remarkable property in the universe. Now, these are, these are big statements, major claims coming from establishments, and they're talking about something exotic that they don't even understand, and yet they're giving it names, giving it titles, and describing it. In ancient times, the, the attributes of these things was very much a part of the text. They simply didn't use words like superconductivity, they didn't use words like gravity or anti-gravity. Newton wasn't around. Um, but they used definitions of priestly levitation and godly communications and these sort of things. And um, there was this phenomenal power, which the Greeks in their literature called the electricus. It's where the word electricity finally comes from, the electricus. A phenomenal heavenly power that, that, that um, was destructive and, and, and various things. In Greek mythology, um, the power of projection, the gold, gold mufkut, the shamana was at the heart of the Golden Fleece Quest legend. It was really what it was all about. Um, it, in the Bible, it, it comes into the story of Moses and the Ark of the Covenant at Mount Sinai, and there are very specific references to, to powders in, in, in the context of that story. Um, it's alchemical in a way that, you know, anything which really revolves around gold in a historical and magical sense has an alchemical ring about it. And, and so it's very interesting just to look back at some of the old alchemical texts and just now, in the light of the discoveries of the last few years, to see how they stack up with, with what we now know that maybe we didn't know 20, 30 years ago. And we can go back to one fellow, a 17th century philosopher, very, very famous in, in English history, a fellow called Arrhenius Philalethes. And, and this guy was a sort of a mentor for those wonderful scientists that founded and, and started the Royal Society, the, the, the Scientific Institute, that, that bred people like Robert Hooke and Robert Boyle and Edmund Halley, Isaac Newton, Christopher Wren, that, those sort of people. This, this fellow was, was, was a sort of a mentor, a teacher of these people, Arrhenius Philalethes. And he was a renowned, a renowned alchemist. Uh, but so were the early Royal Society members. I mean, Ro Ro Robert Boyle particularly, they used to have, I don't know, the, the equivalent of, of the CIA watching over his shoulder all the time because he was up to some very strange stuff, important as he was. In, in the world of science as it's evolved. But anyway, this, this fellow, Philalethes, decided in 1667 
that he would actually start to get the matter straight regarding the Philosopher's Stone. The church had published quite a lot of very old literature. The church had even published literature in the public domain that was supposed to be translations of work by alchemists, but it wasn't. It was simply church propaganda that had got into the market. So he decided to introduce this treatise to explain the Philosopher's Stone. And it was fairly lengthy. He called it um, Secrets Revealed. It was published in Amsterdam in 1667. And um, what he stated was this. Our stone, our Philosopher's Stone, is nothing but gold. It's gold digested to the highest degree of purity and subtle fixation. We call it a stone only because of its fixed nature. It resists the action of fire as successfully as any stone. In species, it is no more than gold, more pure than the purest, but its appearance is that of a very fine powder. So there is this, probably the number one alchemist in, in terms of that period of um, great scientific history, making the point that the Philosopher's Stone wasn't about making other things into gold. <coughs> it was gold, but it had, as he went on, remarkable attributes. It was gold in a digested form, as he called it, powder. If we go back 200 years to Nicolas Flamel, we go to France, we go to this, this, this very, very famous scientist, or alchemist as history is now calling him, and we find that, that in his last testament, and he wrote his last testament in November 1416 and decided that he, this is 200 years before, would put matters straight regarding the Philosopher's Stone because this fellow, who really had started from nothing, had founded hospitals, colleges and whatever in various parts of France and nobody knew where he got his money from. Well, he made it out of um, doing dealings with this stuff and in fact we can find deals with this stuff going way back into biblical times. That's how a lot of kings got very, very rich by selling this material. What he said was, when the noble metal of gold is perfectly dried and digested, it forms a fine powder which is the philosopher's stone. Same thing again, exactly. So we know here that we're dealing with something that, that in essence might well have been what was the Philosopher's Stone, but does it have the attributes? Can it do the things that the old Philosopher's Stone was said to do? Can it do what Shemana and Mufkot of olden times could do? Well, the answer in all cases is yes and more. Um, the pyramid texts are interesting. Um, I'll have the next slide, please, William, if we can. Uh, thank you. Wow. This is... There you go technicians. The, the pyramid texts are interesting. Um, they talk about something called the field of Mufkut, the realm of Mufkut. And this, this, this is again relating to the, 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 the magical powder of projection. The field of Mufkut was said to be where the pharaohs went to communicate with the gods and from where they returned being like the gods. So what the pyramids do here is to introduce something a little different. They're actually introducing us to a realm, a field, a, a place, a dimension that the pharaohs apparently seem to come and go from. And um, in doing so, that they became more godlike. They became the god kings that supposedly they were. Um, there are various references to, to this material, Mufkut. One of them is... This one here, which is a relief from a temple at Karnak, it, it, it um, portrays the treasures of Tutmosis III, Pharaoh. Um, there are shelves, they're all stacked out with his various um, treasures, and they're all graded into sequence of, of what are gems and what are, uh, you know, certain, certain metals and, and, and precious elements and things like that. And, and within it, you can see marked in yellow, these, these little golden coney things over there. On, on the left, there's some down and some a little higher. And these are very, very interesting um, things because it says that they're gold. These are gold. They're in the gold section and they're called gold, but it says we call them white bread. That's rather odd. It's not so odd when we get to where we're going, but they're gold. 
They're shem-shaped, as Sitchin will tell you, the, the conical shape, the highwood shape. They're gold, but they're bread. And we think about the ingestion by the kings of this stuff and how they might have done it, so it's beginning to fall into place from pictures like this. It was in about 1450 BC that Tutmosis, this particular pharaoh, actually formed a high council at the Temple of Karnak, 39 high priests on this council. Well, they were more than priests. They were clearly um, scholars and chemists of various sorts. And, and they became known in, in, in writings about them as the Great White Brotherhood. And the Alexandrian texts are quite specific on this, and they say that the reason they were called the Great White Brotherhood was because of their preoccupation with a mysterious white powder of projection. So this council at the Temple of Karnak is set up to deal with, in some way, to manufacture with or to, to, to refine or whatever they were doing with this particular powder, the white powder of projection, a metallurgical fraternity. It's very interesting where temples fall in history. Temples are different to churches. We know that. We just think of them as churches that are grander. But they weren't. They were very, very different places. It's one of the reasons why, when temples were discovered, that their, their contents were removed generally quite quickly. Um, and, and so when one visits temples, not many of the original contents are there. There are wall reliefs and there are all sorts of wonderful things, but the actual content isn't necessarily there. We're told that they were places of worship, but the interesting thing here is the derivation of the word worship. And this is a derivation that applies in all languages, and English forms the same pattern as any other in this. One only has to go back to the 700s in, in England uh, to discover when the word worship lost its middle K. The word was workship. Workship. So the difference between temples and churches was that churches were where people venerated the god or gods. Temples were where they worked for the gods. And that was the difference. So temples actually were places of workship, not worship, which made them workshops. And we'll come to one in a moment, which is quite special in this regard, because it was one that um, wasn't emptied out too quickly before it was written about. Um, next slide, please, William. This is uh, a part of this, this particular temple. This temple was discovered in 1904. We're currently making a, a, a BBC documentary uh, on this for next year, which is the 100th anniversary. 1904, uh, Flinders Petrie, the, the famous British archaeologist, decided um, that he'd like to go off into Sinai. That, that, that little triangular landmass that sits between the gulfs above the Red Sea, between Egypt and, and the Holy Land. And he wanted to do some research in Sinai. It had never really been mapped. And um, Sinai, of course, is, is the, the biblical place of Moses and the Ark of the Covenant. The Israelites came out of Egypt, and Moses took them to this mountain. And so this, this mountain, Mount Horeb, as it's called in Sinai, where all these wonderful and magical events occurred. Fire, lightning on the mountain, all sorts of weird things. Moses spoke with God there. And um, so anyway, Petra decides to take this expedition out there, and he's funded by the Egypt Exploration Fund. Um, and off he goes to Sinai. And uh, the Bible actually explains very, very clearly where this mountain is. It tells you the route taken by Moses and the Israelites to this mountain, which is rather odd because some long, long, long way south of it is the mountain generally shown on maps as Mount Sinai. Well, that was actually a mountain so named by um, a, a group of Christian Greek missionaries in the fourth century. It really had nothing to do with the biblical Mount Sinai of the Old Testament. So anyway, they find this mountain and they climb to the top of it as one does when you find a mountain. And uh, so the team went up. They had no idea what they were really looking for, if anything. I mean, really, they were just mapping the area generally. And at the top of this mountain, they found all sorts of standing stones and things like this just poking up beneath rubble. 
just rubble, on a plateau two and a half thousand feet up. So they started to dig the rubble and clear it and, and, and gradually um, sort of clear the decks and this place got bigger and bigger and bigger until in the end what they uncovered was 270 feet of Egyptian temple which backed onto a cave not much smaller of continuing temple inside the mountain. Now this was an astonishing find. He, he, he came back, or in fact he wrote in his diary that he doesn't think in all of his life as an archaeologist and it was because of him that the Egyptian department was opened at the British Museum and whatever. He, he was the foremost man of his day. He said he'd never found anything like it and he didn't think that anybody would again. He figured this was the most important biblical discovery ever made and probably would ever be made. Anyway, this massive temple all dedicated to the Egyptian goddess Hathor. Now remember, we're not actually in Egypt here. We're, we're in, in this particular place. We're about a couple of hundred miles the wrong side of the Red Sea in the middle of Bedouin desert country. Up a mountain. And there's a temple bigger than anything in Egypt. But it's Egyptian. The reliefs and inscriptions at this place dated back to the fourth dynasty of Egypt. So they go right back to Pharaoh Sneferu and... and Khafre and, and these sort of pharaohs. From then on, every pharaoh to the 19th dynasty, this is just after the time of Akhenaten, every pharaoh has reliefs, inscriptions there, is portrayed, has sayings and things that he'd written at this place. It seemed to be the hub of something very special, but he wrote in his book, or in his report, that this didn't actually seem much like a temple in the way that he'd recognized it. It was more like a workshop. There were benches and funny recessed tables. There were all sorts of receptacles and tanks and metallurgists' crucibles and things he called magic wands and, and whatever. Hieroglyphs for light were all over this place and Mufkut everywhere. On all engravings, Mufkut seemed to predominate. And the temple said the inscriptions was called the House of Gold. So this thing dates back. It, it's it had been in use for, I don't know, about 1,500 years of Egyptian history in the middle of nowhere, up a mountain, and it had more going for it than any temple that ever really found in Egypt in terms of its, its hieroglyphs and inscriptions. There were no end of um, depictions there showing pharaohs being presented with or presenting the gods with these conical things. Please, William. Zap. There you go. Well, here's an example of, of one of them. We have here uh, the pharaoh. He's seated. There's Hathor, the, the, the goddess, who looks like she's about to do a television, a radio interview with him, doesn't she, with that thing? <laughs> and, um, but behind is this fellow with, with the conical thing. It says on the relief that this is white bread and that he is the treasurer of the house of gold, bringing the food of life to the pharaoh, to the king, as he was called in, in that. There are any number of these there. I mean, lots and lots and lots. So anyway, um, Petri comes back to Britain with his remarkable story and... Um, in a way that we're very familiar with today, politically, religiously, he was um, prevented from doing too much with this information. Uh, he'd actually broken a rule of his funding. And it was a very straightforward rule. And it's on the very first page of the memorandum and articles of the fund that, that he got his money from. And it says that the Egyptian Exploration Fund will give, grant money for expeditions that make discoveries that underpin the teaching of the Old Testament. Not underpin the Old Testament, underpin the teaching of it. And what had happened here was that he'd found something. I mean, there were furnaces at this place. And he said, look, in the book of Exodus, it talks about furnaces on the mountain, and smoke and all of this noise going on. And the, you know, that's, that's not the way it's taught, they said. It, it, this is God's magic and, and to, to put 
uh, an earthly connotation on all of this destroys the way that it's taught. And so, um, Britain, in fact, the West's number one Egyptologist of that era was denied any further funding for expeditions from, from the major funding institute. And from then on, he had to go to a, a school in Cairo to get his money to carry on with. Anyway, Mufkat, this stuff, Mount Horeb in Sinai, a temple that just like the Exodus portrayals had a furnace, metallurgist crucibles, but above all, what he found that he said was so stunning that he couldn't work out was an amazing storehouse of white powder. Stored very carefully in this place. Been there for all of these thousands of years, untouched beneath all this rubble and beneath flagstones. And he found it. Well, apparently some was taken back to Britain, now the rest, it seems, was just left there open to the desert winds. They didn't think it was that important. They just thought it was clearly important to the priests of the old workshop, temple. But anyway, this was the Mufkut. This was the stuff that was the food of light in the descriptions, and this was the result of the house of gold. It seemed that what they were doing there was making this material. Why there? Well, as we found out from modern science, this stuff can actually be very, very dangerous. Um, gamma rays have been emitted from it. I mean, it, it, it's extraordinarily good, but like most scientific discoveries, what cures one thing and solves one problem can be very destructive in another way. It was clearly also a secret. And so there were two reasons for, for, for burying its manufacturer in a cave in the middle of a temple in the middle of nowhere. One, this stuff arrived on scene in Egypt from where people never knew from, where from, and also because of its danger aspects, it was kept well away from the city centers and the main centers in Egypt. So, you know, this is a real, the first real alchemical workshop, probably in the world. And they weren't allowed to talk about it. But interestingly, if we think about the Bible and that particular bit of the story in Exodus, this is the way that a bit of it goes. Moses came down from the mountain, he'd been talking to God, and he got the ta tables of the Ten Commandments, and he got back down, and the, his brother Aaron said, you've been gone a long time, Moses, and we've got fed up with waiting for you and this new God thing, and, and we've made this golden calf to worship. And his brother says, I've collected all the earrings from the Israelites and I've melted them down and I've made this golden calf. Uh, which Moses breaks the tablets for some reason. I don't know why, but he breaks the tablets in his anger. And it then says, Moses took the golden calf, burnt it with fire, transposed it into powder, mixed it with water and fed it to the Israelites. Why? That's a very strange sort of punishment. It sounds more like a ritual, actually, just written in a strange way, which of course it was. But he took the golden calf and burnt it with fire, and it became powder? That doesn't happen. It becomes molten gold, or it becomes black sticky stuff, or whatever, but it doesn't become powder. Yes, it does. But we didn't know that until very recently. And so the question that theologians and scientists have avoided for the longest time is now beginning to have an answer. With the use of fire, with the use of heat, and in fact with, with a number of things, one can, can in effect turn gold into powder, which used to be apparently mixed with water or made into these conical bread cakes. And it was fed to the priests and the kings. It was said to give them wonderful powers of, of perception, of aptitude, um, intuition, all of those things that would go to make a good leader. <coughs> and they were fed with it, but they also moved in and out of this thing called the field of Mufkut, this realm where they talked to the gods. Um, well, clearly this was going on in terms of, of any documentation that we can find, we're looking at about 2,500 to 3,000 BC is the sort of era where the first examples of this come up. 
um, in Mesopotamian texts and in Egyptian texts. And we can't really go much further back than that because um, you know, the, the, there aren't too many written documents, if any, that come from a period much beyond that. So we, we have to presume that perhaps when they were writing about it, it was about when it started, but it may have been a little older. Next slide, please, William. And um, anyway, oh, that's not, oh, that's the calf that I spoke about. Yes, next slide, please, William. I missed that one. The bread stuff, it's, it's weird. You see these things all over the place. If you're in Egypt again, look for them. They're everywhere, these presentations of these little conical bread things. Um, they're, they're really quite interesting. The Egyptians called it shafa as well as mufka. Um, it was said to feed and nurture light bodies. The Egyptians reckoned that um, as well as a physical body, we all have a light body. And they said there's no point in just feeding physical bodies. You have to nurture and feed the light body so that it grows the same, so that it develops in the same way. They called it the car. You probably know that, of course. And the food of the car was light, and the substance of light was mufkut. So this is the food of light, which again is something which modern science now substantiates. This powder is actually atoms of light waves. That's all it is, just little atoms of light waves. All gold is, when you get it down to an elemental state, are little light waves moving not at the speed of light, but at the speed of sound. They're very slow, but they're quite astonishing. There were descriptions of, of how when the kings began to reach the enlightened state, their auras would glow. Around their heads in the Babylonian and Mesopotamian text, these auras would begin to glow, which seems perhaps to be the beginning of the, the halo concept of these light auras around the heads of the great priestly and, and, and um, sacred figures of the era, which is why they were obviously sacred figures. Um, the food of the car was light. No secret about that. Once you start looking for it, you keep finding it. Um, in terms of its re-emergence, um, it, it happened here. I mean, it took all of that time from Petri getting nowhere in 1904. You got all the way to 1976. And just up the way from here, um, a, a cotton farmer called David Hudson by pure chance, discovered the material again. And it's an amazing story, which I've, I've covered in one chapter of the book. I've just sort of devoted it to, to David's findings. And um, I met with him last night because he's been out of the picture for a while um, for various reasons of, of health and, and whatever. But what happened was that, that his cotton farm suffered from, from a very strange alkaline content, the, the soil. And um, this is the third generation stuff, you know, his father had the same problem, his grandfather had the same problem. His father was actually Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of Arizona. So they were a pretty, very influential family, quite wealthy. Um, but anyway, the, this, this soil needed breaking down. They could only plant on a three-year rotation program. And they had to break down this alkaline stuff by bringing in sulfuric acid in trucks and spreading it over the land. 30 tons of sulfuric acid to the acre. Then irrigation trucks following in behind to, to foam it and froth it. And during the course of this, this funny substance all came to the surface. And once they cleared that and dug it all away again, put in some cal calcium carbonate to buffer the soils, it was ready for planting again. And that was a three-year program. Well, what, what David decided to do was to try and investigate this stuff to see what it was. So the first thing that happened was that, that <coughs> they took it into a lab and, and, and started to sort of try and separate the, the elements, the, the, the substances in this crunchy stuff. And there was one particular aspect, uh, part of it, that was really quite astonishing because once they sort of separated this substance from the rest and precipitated it out, they just used to put it in little filters and sort of put it out in the sun to dry so that they could see what this stuff was, but they never got around to seeing it because the moment the Arizona sun hit it, it exploded and disappeared. Just simply vanished from sight, totally. And the, the, the flashes were apparently astonishing, like, like thousands of flash bulbs going off at the same time. So he decided really that, that this had to be investigated 
further. I've got a picture of David, if you can click the next one. He's, um, that was him in the days when he was lecturing about this in the, uh, in the middle 1990s. Um, Cornell University at that time had this amazing new machine. Um, it, it was publicized at the time and it was said that this, this machine was, was um, really the, 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 the new thing for science. They could analyze down to three to five parts of anything per billion. They could tell you what three billionths of something was that you had. And he said, well, look, I, I've got this. I want to know what 100% of it is. What is this? It disappears. It, it explodes in a blaze of light. It's weird stuff. So um, they tested it and, and they said, well, it's just silica and aluminum. It's nothing special. Well, clearly it was something special because those things, a bit of iron in it, a bit of oxygen in it, but they don't explode. They, they don't do what this was doing. And in fact, they don't even look like this looked. Um, so anyway, he gave up with them and, and, and decided that, that he'd set up uh, the beginning of a team of his own and they'd start, they were doing tests with, they got this spectroscopist a um, German spectroscopist and he'd worked for a firm in LA that built spectroscopic equipment and whatever uh, next one please um, the way that a spectroscope works is for those that don't know, is very very simple actually, it's, it, I mean it's a hell of a machine but it's simple you have two carbon electrodes one has got a little cup in it you put your sample in the cup you bring down the other electrode and you strike an arc, an electronic arc, and it then tells you what the substance is. But it will break down the substance little by little. So for example, if you had your car engine, or automobile engine, in a spectroscope and it had the water uh, system in it as well, it would tell you it was water. It would tell you if this engine is water, until the arc had burnt all the water away, until it had ev evaporated, only then would it tell you the metal that it was made from. So this is really what was happening here. They did the spectroscopic analysis and it told them it was silica and iron and aluminum. That was it. Well, they actually figured that, um, that, that there must be more to it than that. Because what happened at that stage, it takes about 15 seconds, but the electrodes just burn away. And so at that stage, nothing should be left. That should have told them all it was, but they were still 98% of what they started with there. And when they did the test with that, it was a new test, it told them it was nothing. Pure nothing. <laughs> so anyway, they did all of these tests and it kept telling them it was nothing. Somebody said, look Dave, you've got to send this off to Eng England. At Harwell Laboratories in England, that they've got neutron activation analysis. This does, just doesn't look at the elements or even the atoms, this looks at the, the, um, the nucleus of, of anything. It'll tell you what this truly and really is. There is nowhere in the world that can give you a better analysis than Harwell Labs in Britain. So they sent the sample over. And in fact what they did, they were really quite clever. They put it through the spectroscope, they did the 15 second burning, they got rid of that 2%, which was the bit of silica and iron and whatever, and sent the 98% sample that was left to Harwell. And Harwell came back and said, for the first time in our history, we have tested and analyzed something which we can only tell you is pure nothing. <laughs> nothing. Didn't recognize it at all. Well, that's kind of weird, isn't it? You know, nothing. <laughs> then um, the Russian Academy of Sciences literature came on the scene, and the Russians had always been very good at telling us that in the West we haven't got much of a clue uh, in terms of scientific analysis. And they said, look, if you analyze something for 15 seconds and something is still there, it means you haven't analyzed it for long enough. Pretty simple. The reason that you can't analyze it any further is because your electrodes burn away. We suspect that you're going to have to burn this for five minutes, 300 seconds. So sheath your electrodes in an inert gas, helium, argon, something like that. Sheath them. Stop the oxygen getting to them to burn them away. 
arc this for 300 seconds and it will tell you what it really is. So they built the machine to Russian specifications, put the stuff in there, first 15 seconds, iron, silica, aluminum, bit of oxygen, bit of calcium, that's it, gone. 20 seconds goes by, nothing, 30 seconds, 40, 50, 60, 65, and at 70 seconds, it tells them that it's palladium. Now, palladium is one of the platinum group metals. After another 20 seconds, it said it was platinum. So now the palladium's burned away. The, its, its boiling point is past. Platinum's now coming on the scene. After that, each in succession, according to its boiling temperature, of the other platinum group metals comes into the picture. It was palladium, then it was platinum, then it was ruthenium, then it was rhodium, then it was iridium, then it was osmium. One by one, all of the platinum group metals read in this sample that American and British testing had said was nothing. It was 100% platinum in all the groupings that platinum can have. They worked out, actually, in real terms from these samples, how much of this stuff there was in any amount of soil. And it transpired that in ounces per tonne of soil, there were seven and a half thousand times more of these platinums than in the best platinum mine in South Africa. Seven and a half thousand times. But in a form that nobody recognized as platinums. Gold falls into the same category. It's the same type of metal as platinum. They're, they're noble, single-element metals. Um, but it isn't metal, so it doesn't have the same purpose. It, it doesn't, you know, suddenly we, we don't say, well, we're going to mine in Arizona instead of Africa, because it's, it's an element. It, it looks like that powder. It's very, very different. But that's what it is. These are metals in a form that science had never, ever known about before. They were not on the periodic table, and yet the more they then began to work with them, the more they discovered that this was one of the most exciting elemental discoveries ever made. Well, at that time, um, uh, Dave discovered that they were, were, were doing... Um, That's a strange picture. Is there anything before that? Uh, no. Oh, well, don't worry, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Um, General Electric were working on um, fuel cells up in Massachusetts. So he goes up there and he said, look, I, I hear you're working with platinum group metals, rhodium, iridium, things like that, and trying to formulate a fuel cell structure. He said, um, I, I've got this stuff here which seems to be rhodium and iridium and various other things. I, I just wonder whether you can help me ascertain how we might use it. Would it be any good for what you're doing? And they looked at it and they said, he said, the trouble is it doesn't analyze as anything. And they said, yeah, we've been having that. And he said, and, and also, if you put it in the sun, it explodes in a blaze of light. And they said, yeah, we've had that as well. And he said, but we now know that this is rhodium and iridium and ruthenium and osmium and platinum and palladium, but it doesn't analyze it. And they said, yeah. Well, we're past caring about what things analyze at now because we know that if it was rhodium and we're making this sort of stuff from rhodium and it does what yours does, then the analysis is nonsense anyway, so we don't care. We're going to be using this for fuel cells. Well, the long and short of it was that um, they worked together for a while, the government got in the way, and in the end nothing really progressed. But um, during the course of it all, David Hudson was advised to patent this process. And so he did, but in the course of it, there's a, a very strange thing about lodging patents for applications. You have to describe the weight of the substance that you're dealing with. And, and the thing about weights is that weights can fluctuate a little according to temperature. Um, so they have this equipment called thermogravimetric analysis. 
And what that does is that it heats and cools things and weighs them while it's happening. So it's constantly reading the weight. Well, this was quite astonishing. Um, and the tests got more violent as they went on, as they got more excited with it. To start with, they were using small amounts of heat, or low cooling, but, but they were finding that whenever the heat went up, the stuff got lighter. Whenever the heat, the, the cooling was put into place, it got heavier. Well, it actually reached a point where it was weighing in its cold state five, six, seven hundred times what it had started at. But at the other end of the scale, it was registering zero and less than nothing. In fact, when they took it out of the pan, the pan then weighed more without the stuff in it than it did with it in it. <laughs> Now this is quite interesting because we can go back to our old texts and we find these Egyptian documents, certainly those out of Alexandria, some wonderful stuff comes out of the Alexandrian period. And there's one particular document which talks about the Paradise Stone, which is just the same as the powder of projection, it's this powder stuff again in a way, it talks about this being the, the key to opening the gateway to Paradise. The Paradise Stone was how Alexander the Great visited Paradise. So think in terms again of the realm of Mufkuts, this field that the Egyptian pharaohs were supposed to move in and out of. And it said, and again we must remember here, that although David at that time was working with platinums, gold is equally in this picture. The gold and platinum group is the same group. Um, it says that the Paradise Stone can be made to outweigh its original quantity of gold, i.e. it can weigh more than the gold it was made from. However, they say, when it's fully a powder, even a feather will be heavier than it in the scales. Now, this comes from a few hundred years BC and it was exactly what they were discovering, that this stuff was doing just that. It was going to be heavier, than what the metal it had started from, but it was also weighing less than a feather. It was weighing less than nothing. And in fact, there was one particular point where the heat, uh, the heat temperature changed the weight so much that it was an instant and very dramatic change when suddenly 44% um, of the weight just disappeared like in a flash, gone. And that was a flash of light, an amazing flash of light and so the substance suddenly weighed 56% of, of what it had started to weigh. Now this is, is kind of interesting because um, at the same time, Hal Putoff at um, the Institute of Advanced Studies in Austin in Texas had been working on uh, zero point energy research and, and, and Sakharov's Russian um, mathematics of gravity and he'd actually worked out from these mathematics that when an elemental substance begins to resonate in another dimension, when it begins to resonate in another di dimension, it should at that moment lose four-ninths of its gravitational weight. Well, four-ninths is 44%. It's the same. So, so in fact, what happened was, was, was that, that Putoff and Sakharov's theory on this was actually proved by these experiments, this, this disappeared. What actually happened was that the stuff would then go lighter and lighter and lighter to zero, 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 and then it reached a point where it just disappeared altogether. It wasn't even there. You look in the pan and um, it's nothing. Um, when transposed to a powder, even a feather will tip the scales against it. Uh, it was doing these strange things. The 44% was the light flash. So when this thing in the field originally was exploding with this blaze of light, that was the 44% of its weight escaping. So they decided then, I mean, various scientists looking on, they said, hey, this is interesting, light seems to have weight. Well, in fact, light doesn't have weight. Light illuminates space, space-time. <clears throat> and so from that they sort of gleaned and proved to themselves even more than they probably already knew 
that space-time has weight. Therefore, it has mass. Therefore, it is manipulable. Therefore, you can do things with a piece of space-time if it has that weight. So that was, that was a bit of science that, that led somewhere else. I wonder what picture we can get up here now. Where do, where do you think this might go? Oh, back to that. What comes next? Um, oh, that's a good one. White powder and a spoon. Yes, that'll do. That's fine. Yeah. This is the stuff. Um, again, I, I, under lab tests. Amazing stuff. It disappeared from sight. Totally. Um, the theory was put forward that maybe it wasn't just invisible. Maybe something else had happened to it. Maybe it had actually moved into another dimension of space-time. Maybe it wasn't there now at all. So the logic behind this was, was, was very simple. If you have something and it's a powdery substance and it's sitting there in a pan and it becomes invisible, that simply means that it's still there and you can't see it. So if you take a spatula and mess it up where it was, when it comes back into vision, it should be messed up. Well, it wasn't. It was coming back just as it left. In the little pyramid shapes or whatever they had, it was just coming back in that same form. So that was kind of intriguing. This stuff was really resonating in a completely different dimension. And, and just like the old text said, this stuff has the power to move interdimensionally. It also, they reckoned in the old text, has the power to transmit its, but they didn't use anti-gravity, but the, its weightlessness to other things. Now in terms of other things, at that stage we were looking at, the, well we, they were looking at the pan in the laboratory. It was weighing more with the stuff out of it than it did with the stuff in it. So this stuff, when it became anti-gravitational, clearly Ooh. had the ability to transfer that to what it was on, what it was in. Now, I don't know quite what that might prove historically, but just think in terms of the fact that when Petri found the mountain, this goes right back to the early <coughs> dynasties of Egypt, they found tons of this powder hidden away, and the references in there were to do with everything that the pharaohs ever did in Egypt, including pyramid building. This stuff will transfer its own weightlessness to its host. Just think about that. It doesn't prove anything. It's a hypothesis, but it's a very interesting one. If, if it's a valid hypothesis, it's the same hypothesis that applies to Gothic cathedrals in Europe. The Templars had a great knowledge of this through Alexandrian and Persian alchemy. They used these same sorts of techniques. It's why when one goes now to France and goes to the great Notre Dame, Gothic cathedrals with an architect, the architect says, wow, we couldn't build that today. We couldn't possibly build a span that wide above a floor with no supports. We would be able to build much better multi-story car parks and all sorts if we could. We don't know how they did that. Well, actually, we do know how they did that now. <coughs> Those buildings all have a gravitational aspect that pushes upwards. It actually pushes upwards in the stone. And when we study stones and look for monatomic elements, these, white, these substances, in nature's own form, we find that certain stones are very, very high in them. So in essence, one doesn't have to transfer the weightlessness from the subject on something into that something. This already exists within it. You only have to trigger it in a way to make it use its anti-gravitational powers. The reason those buildings are like they are is because when you put hydraulic jacks under, uh, under the bricks, the, the, the stones, they, it doesn't react in the same way with the same weight pushing down. The weight pushes upwards. They are very anti-gravitational buildings. And this all came from the mystic school of Omar Khayyam in Persia. Alchemists designed those cathedrals with the powder of projection. So that's, that's quite astonishing. Anyway, in terms of levitation, um, it was discovered that this stuff was a superconductor. 
unlike um, an electronic conductor which needs contacts, physical wires and contacts to transmit energy through a system, superconductors don't. They will communicate with each other through their inherent light waves. You simply have to resonance frequency tune them together. And one of the examples that Dave Hudson was, was very keen of, uh, on giving was that, that you can actually trigger a superconductor in Seattle and send energy forever to New York and it will carry on literally forever until you turn off that resonance frequency tuning. Um, if you can find that little picture of the floating superconductor again, that would be good. That's it. That's an interesting one. That's the superconductor simply just floating in air. Um, the, the, the theory is not, not difficult to understand. It's, it's based on beating the gravitational force. Earth's gravitational force seems to be strong. It seems to hold us all in place, but it's not very strong. And you can pick up the smallest little magnet and go around picking up things all over your desk in opposition to everything that the Earth's gravitational force will give you against that, but you can defeat it that easily. It's not a strong force. Well, superconductors are, are strange beasts in terms of, I mean, everything basically ha is magnetic, but they have a null magnetic field. They actually repel other magnetic fields. They repel north and south poles. They build up around them a field that expels these other fields. Well, the interesting thing about that is the Earth itself is a magnet. So it will repel the Earth's magnetic field and therefore will simply sit above magnetic fields. Superconductors will levitate in this. They don't have to be magical white powders. They will do it anyway in, in, many, um, in many circumstances. They will link together over any distance um, researchers now in Denmark at, at the university there at the uh, University of Vienna um, at Copenhagen in Denmark, they've been working now on, on superconductive linking of particles millions of light years apart, millions of light years apart and they can do it. They say we, we can just tune them to each other, we can send anything we want between them in light waves, in the speed of light. And they're talking now, when they say anything, they're talking about energy, graphic images, text, and ultimately, physical substance. Physical substance transferred in light waves. I think there might be another one like that afterwards. Um, very similar to it. No, no. That's it. There's another one. This is a hovering superconductor. I, this is quite an interesting picture because it seems to show this shimmering field be beneath the hover. Um, so it's quite an interesting one. Anyway, they decided that these things were moving in parallel planes, other dimensions. Uh, when they tried to move it with their spatulas, it came back in just the same way that it was sitting there before. Nothing had disappeared. And in the meantime, with all of this going on, we have our world's great scientists. And in Britain, we've had dear old Sir Martin Rees and Stephen Hawking banging their heads on, on studio, media studio walls, <coughs> trying to get across the message to, to the world at large that these parallel dimensions do exist. It's not the easiest of things to show on a radio, is it? I mean, it really isn't. <laughs> But anyway, from, we, we've had a really nice little series just over the last week or two um, from Professor Brian Green uh, from over here in uh, California, um, who, who's um, written a couple of books about superstrings and parallel dimensions, and, and he suddenly launched the, it onto, onto UK TV screens with computer graphics, and this is astonishing stuff. People are now seeing what strings and superstrings are. They're actually looking at images of, of parallel dimensions and seeing how scientists are perceiving it all works. And it's from that that they begin to argue how many of these there are. Well, the astonishing thing is that, that they do talk about our universe being in existing just within a membrane situation within other universes except that within our universe, there are other <coughs> universes. And they're not even talking about dimensions, they're talking about universes. There might be one, they say, a millimeter away from us, but we can't see it or feel it because it's not in our three-dimensional 
time frame. Well, I'm not sure that I agree with that, that we can't see it or feel it. I think many people, those of you here, if, if not yourselves, will know of those who have felt, seen and experienced these other realms. No doubt of it. It's just that they have been described in a way that hasn't been necessarily scientific. So the world of science hasn't picked them up. But they're beginning to now. So I think those things which were once called astral planes on the one hand and whatever are going to all fall into this pot now as being simply other realms of existence, which is the way I prefer to, to think of them. Whatever they are and wherever they are, they are clearly with us, around us, and part of us. They're not something very, very separate. Um, what have we got next up there? This is, oh, that's, yeah, that's just a hypersystem thing that one of our scientists drew up trying to explain how these rings of existence sort of flow out from each other. They're all on the same plane, but while we're traveling around in one of them, we can't be on the, we can't be on the other one. So that's um, just an artist's um, impression. In May 1995, we're going back just a few years now. Um, how am I doing for time? Are we, are we all right? Oh yeah, that's great. May 1995, Scientific American Journal. Um, had a, a really quite an interesting article in terms of superconductivity in these atoms. Um, it was called the electric gene, this thing. They, they were actually doing some tests on genes by trying to, to, to test um, the amount of electricity. They felt that DNA was conductive. And they were testing for this. Well, they really found that it wasn't conductive. It was superconductive, just like this material. And what they did was they took one atom. If you can imagine this powder is made of lots of atoms, each grain of it, one atom of ruthenium and placed it on one end of a DNA helix strand and one atom and placed it on the other end of this helix strand and it became 10,000 times immediately more conductive than it was. And what happened was that these atoms of this element were communicating with each other through the DNA strand as if it was a piece of wire connecting them. And it was traveling in their light frequency. So this light body concept of the Egyptians isn't so far out. What they discovered, in fact, proved from that, which again they suspected before, was that DNA communicates with itself and each other through a system of light waves. It is superconductive. It will transmit energy, but it transmits light and by adding more light to that, the energy levels increase. It's exactly what the old text told us. Their, their light bodies were fed and nurtured and grew to the extent that they actually began to glow. Astonishing stuff. 10,000 times more conductive. The Platinum Metals Review um, I mean, not a magazine that, that too many people will read, is it? The Platinum Metal Review. But, but, but they, they began a series of wonderful articles. In fact, there were about 40 within the year following that, where they looked at the concept of these elements possibly being cures for diseases. Because they recognized at the time that a lot of disease isn't necessarily... Uh, an illness structure. I mean, cancer, for example, it, 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 one doesn't catch cancer. It's not infectious or, or anything like that. All it really is is, is, a, is a breakdown in the, the DNA structure. That It becomes malformed or deformed in some way. It's not the way that it should be. And what they discovered was, was that these things would actually resonate with that deformed DNA. They would actually cause it to relax and to correct itself. Well, imagine that. DNA that is self-correcting. Now, that's not a cure for cancer. This is an aid to life. It's a very different thing. Cancer treatment generally is terribly destructive. It relies on 
bombarding with radiation, shooting your immune systems to bits with chemotherapy and dreadful drugs, um, burning away surrounding tissue, amputating bits of you if that's what they want to do. But that, they say, kills the cancer. Well, so would a bullet to the head, you know. It, it would, it's, if their objective is killing cancer, then maybe they should rethink and think, actually, maybe their job should be to protect your life. Because in curing cancer at the moment, they're not too bothered about the life expectancy afterwards. They open up their bottle of champagne when the cancer's killed, not when you've lived another 20 or 30 years. Well, here was a way that was pro-life. It wasn't anti-cancer, it was pro-life. This was resonating with DNA. It was actually causing the DNA to correct itself in accordance with its original memory. Well, that's pretty remarkable. Now, if you add that to the fact that, that it was known then that clearly this was going to be <coughs> fuel cell material, which would mean fossil fuels were, were not going to be needed in the future because this stuff transmits energy through its own light waves and could ultimately power anything from your household to the aircraft or, or whatever that you travel in. Well, this begins to look like bad news for oil corporations and drug companies, doesn't it? This is not good news for them, the fact that, that their economies could actually collapse in a very short space of time because of new sciences based on elements derived from noble metals. And then the sales started and the secret buyers came along. And it didn't take a lot really for me to imagine, well, perhaps these are the people that are buying it. Maybe they're putting themselves in a position now, or governments are allowing them to put themselves in a position where instead of the world economy collapsing, as the oil and the drugs need diminishes, they can then be the suppliers of the new raw source material. So the economy would remain buoyant on a world scale. Well, if that's the case, I, I think that would appear fairly logical to anybody, and I don't know why they don't just tell us the truth, but they're not telling us at the moment. Anyway, um, Recently, out of Sp Spain, France, Italy, Israel, Switzerland, Germany, we're getting lots and lots of literature now in the scientific domain talking about, and suddenly the word is being used. In this last year or so, they're using the word monatomic gold nanoclusters are at the front of cancer treatment research. At last they're using the word monatomic. Not many years ago, scientists would have told us there's no such thing as monatomic gold. We can't get gold down to the monoatom, they would tell you. Well, now they are, and because they can do it, it's okay. We can talk about it now. <laughs> but how do you do it? How do you put into operation a situation where you're dealing with things so small. You know, it's, it's okay, isn't it, on a lab bench too, I suppose it's okay if you've got good glasses, to, to work with a DNA strand and two atoms. That's okay. But how do you do it in real life? Now, how do you actually go to a person's body, recognize which bit of DNA is malformed, and get a single atom to it, or two atoms. How do you do that? It's, it's an impossible task. Well, what's, what's happening now, and between that article in 1995 and, and now, this whole new world called nanotechnology has built up. The more expansive scientific research gets, the more compact it gets. The macrocosm is now being answered every time by the microcosm. How big is the problem? How small is the answer? Because it's always going to be small now. How do we do that? Well, computers has to be the answer. Nobody really doubts that anymore because computers 
will and are the, be an, are the answer to many, many things. Um, because they can direct operations and, and, and run all sorts of shows for us. Um, in nano terms, a nano is a billionth of a centimeter, it's a little tiddly measurement, so, so small. Um, the journals Nature and various other journals announced a year ago now that very powerful computers had been developed very powerful computers that would fit within the full stop of a sentence in a typed piece of paper. Within a full stop. Very powerful computers. The first ones were developed over here at Cornell and at Harvard universities. Um, far more powerful than anything that any one of us has on our desk, in our office or at home. Far more powerful. One hundred times Oh, sorry, 100,000 times thinner than a human hair. 100,000 times thinner than a human hair. A computer more powerful than anything any of us have ever used. Just to put this into perspective, Intel, in 1993, that's 10 years ago now, their most powerful microprocessor, had 3.1 million transistors on a chip, on a single silicon chip, 3.1 million. The latest ones hold about 40 million. These ones, that are 100,000 times thinner than a human hair, multiply that by 100. 4,000 million transistors on a chip and it is so small, it's indefinable. If you can uh, pop up there. These are the sort of things that we're going to be led to now. How do you get a single atom put on the end of a DNA strand? You do it with a tiny little microscopic thing like that shown against blood cells which will simply carry it to where it's supposed to be and put it there. A very powerful little nanobot. Nanobot. <coughs> well, there's perhaps something a bit scary about nanobots. I don't know whether any of you have read um, Michael Crichton's latest book, Prey, he's the Jurassic Park man. Um, he talks about nanobots taking over the world. Um, well, maybe. Who knows? I mean, it, it's up to us, isn't it? I, I, my, my feeling is, is a straightforward one on this. The very day that the first spark was struck and we knew how to make fire, we could cook our food and forever afterwards keep ourselves warm. But from that day, we could also burn down each other's houses. So there has never, ever been a discovery that doesn't have a downside. And the downside is in our control, really. Um, we've had the ability to blow up the whole planet for a long, long time now, but we haven't done it. There's no reason why nanobots should take over the world, but they can save millions and millions of lives or improve lives. These things, apparently, we're told by the Institute of Nanotechnology now, don't actually have to answer the question, how do you get to a malformed or damaged DNA strand to repair it? Because we could actually have these as little body roaming wardens that would never allow our DNA to get in a mess in the first place. These little computers that just sort of keep us as we should be. Well, it's, it's clever stuff. You know, I don't know whether this is good news or bad news. It's very exciting news. And scientifically, it's quite astonishing and quite astounding that all of this has happened in such very few years. It does make you wonder where the next few years will take us, you know, because these things snowball when they start to move um, as they do. Um, in terms of, of the, uh, their effect on, on the body, you know, if we go back to the idea of ingesting these substances as they used to, it, it seems now that, that, that what actually they do, apart from the DNA correcting, 
is that they react to the endocrinal glandular system. And interestingly, different metals, gold, platinum, palladium, iridium, rhodium, ruthenium, osmium, each of them seems to link up, you've got gold and six others, so you've got seven, and they each react to different glands in the, the, the body glandular system, which is like the chakra system, really. And they have the effect of heightening and enhancing the um, secretions of the hormones from those glands. And um, gold, for example, is, is supposed to be, has its main effect on the pineal gland. Um, which affects the production of melatonin and also it is thought now the, the thing that they're calling the DA uh, the, the spirit molecule DMT spirit molecule which is a very strange part of our chemical structure that is actually um, uh, a bit like LSD actually it's, it's a visionary state thing um, very much to do with perception and intuition. Not a lot's known about this spirit molecule, but, but apparently this gold stuff will do it. Serotonin uh, and the pituitary gland, iridium seems to affect. So if one is using these metals and, and the powders in the way that one could, you could actually really decide what hormone you're trying to reactivate what glands you're trying to stir and heighten and go for the element from the metal most likely to do that. Or you could have the multi-pack. <laughs> but clearly what they're saying now is that it will make a, a nonsense out of things like hormone replacement therapy. I mean, why? Why go through the problems that can be associated and side effects and whatever by trying to replace hormones that aren't your own? Coming from the desiccated glands maybe of some dead animal and, and I mean why not just give a little zap and a little zip to that gland that you have that produces those things and make it reproduce more of what's now missing? This seems to make much more sense, it's much more natural. You're dealing with something that isn't a drug. It's totally non-invasive. Um, nothing toxic anywhere in it. It's lost all of its heavy metal qualities. They've gone. The metal, metal, bronze are broken. Just a silica. But a silica with magical, magical properties. It feeds the light body the car. Um, all sorts of other things started to happen in the 90s as well. Stealth atoms. They started to talk about stealth atoms. These weird things that were in the body and were seemingly in all sorts of other things. Atoms that, that communicated with each other through a strange exotic element. And so you've got people over here like the uh, Argonne National Labs at, at Chicago, um, Oak Ridge National Labs down in uh, Tennessee, I believe is it, yeah. And um, Los Alamos National Labs. Um, all beginning to look with great seriousness at these materials which were not before in the periodic table. Nobody working at these labs ever went to school and came away with a periodic table that had these things in it, but they now know where they go, how to put them in, and what their, their functions are. So they're working with them. I had um, a communication from a, a guy at not Los Alamos um, National Labs just a week or two ago and he came up with an idea and he said look I've got a feeling that once this stuff moves into its monatomic state it isn't actually physical as such at all. He said the tests I've been doing recently seem to show me that it's very possibly an inert gas. So this physical substance is becoming gas particles full of light which actually is is perhaps not so far off the mark as a possibility because if this stuff is becoming anti-gravitational at that stage its physical mass in some way probably does disappear and so why not if it becomes a gas um, a gas element well, that's, that's kind of interesting but what, what we're what we're proving then is that we have the ability simply to relieve ourselves of the physical mass of anything and turn it into a light wave form 
And once we do that, we can transport it anywhere we like. They're working now on the most astonishing new aircraft, which we'll touch on in a minute. But actually, by the time they develop them, we won't need aircraft. <laughs> it's, it's moving that fast. <laughs> Manipulation of space-time was also a big late 90s thing, or middle night late 90s thing. It came really from the starting point of the light has weight, no, the space-time has weight, therefore it probably has mass and we can then manipulate it. So this whole idea of manipulating space-time then became very, very forefront. Um, again, we're back in the, in the middle 90s and um, there's a Mexican scientist, a, a, a physical mathematician called Miguel Alcabuer. And he was operating out of the University of Wales in Britain and, and linked up um, uh, 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 to the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And he wrote an astonishing article in the journal Classical and Quantum Gravity. And I, I'll read you the article because it's the, the only way I can describe it. He says, it is now known that it is possible to modify space-time in a way that allows a spaceship to travel at an arbitrarily large speed by a purely locational expansion of the space-time behind the ship and an opposite contraction in front of it. We achieve a motion faster than the speed of light, reminiscent of the warp drive of science fiction. Well, it's the sort of article that one would have expected to sort of be viewed with a little bit of suspicion and popped aside and, and something to be looked at in a few years' time. Within a fortnight, NASA came up with their picture for the article. This is NASA's own artistic design of this, and they called it Alcabier's Warp Drive. Straight out of Star Trek, Warp Drive. And he called it that. Faster than the speed of light, reminiscent of the warp drive of science fiction. How does it work? It works like this. You have a spaceship, you have people in the spaceship, and you know that by Einstein's theory and everything else that we understand, we cannot travel faster than light. We also know that out there in space is a lot of big distances. We know that rocket fuel expires and that life spans expire. And so we have this big problem. It's an insurmountable problem because we're never going to be able to investigate out there. Except by applying this theory. And they're working on it and it's beginning to show some results. Why not let's, let, let's forget about propelling anything? Why don't we just say, here's the craft, and there's a million light years, and let's just pick this up and put it behind it. <laughs> That's the theory of this warp drive. You don't move the craft, you move the space-time. And you do it by crumpling it up and by opening it out. So the people inside the craft have gone nowhere. No fuel has been used. Well, it didn't take long before there were lots of other articles about this. The American scientists took it up and many other journals did. Um, it was decided that Einstein's theory simply was not violated by this at all because nobody was doing any traveling. <laughs> so the fact that we can't travel faster than light didn't matter. Um, the true rate of acceleration would be zero but the speed of travel would appear incredible. So it was speed of light travel. It just required the manipulation of space-time. And the concept of that came, whether they'll admit it or not, from the early research with these elemental powders. Um, on being questioned uh, uh, about this, the Ohio Aerospace Institute and various others said, I mean, the question that came from the media was, well, okay, let's accept it. But what do we need to make that happen? 
you know, let's presume that we can do this. Let's say that we can crumple up space-time and do that with it. What do we need? What's the device? And they came back unanimously and said, exotic matter. Exotic matter. What is exotic matter? was the next question that the media posed. What is exotic matter? The answer comes back. It is matter with the curious property of having a negative energy density, unlike the stuff that makes up people, planets and stars, which is positive. It will be a superconductor. It will be anti-gravitational. In fact, exotic matter described in every aspect these elemental powders and they had already been termed a few years before that exotic matter so when this answer from the scientists to the question what device do we need was exotic matter they were presuming that the questioner already knew about these substances that's the stuff that we need to do it we need exotic matter they have the ability to bend space-time Superconductors, they decide, are the key to the distance teleportation of matter. United States Department of Energy says, the technique we have is to prepare a pair of coupled quantum systems. We place them some distance apart. It is then possible to take a digital measurement of the local system and to transmit this measurement and open it up and reconstitute it as a new quantum on the other side. They're talking about the Star Trek type beam me up Scotty or anything of that sort. And they carry on and say most significantly by this means even people will be transported by sending enough classical information. Not even presented as a theory or a hypothesis anymore. By this method, this is what we can do. Well, actually, they can't do it yet, but they know precisely how to do it. I don't know who's going to be the first volunteer, but um, it'll, it'll happen. This, says NASA, is the stuff of Star Trek Trek's teleportation of matter by way of a light beam whereby a body's molecular pattern is automatically rearranged and sent to another destination. So here's NASA again. Here's the Department of Energy using things like Star Trek, warp drive, all of these things. Just like I said at the beginning, these scientists in the very front line are now sounding more like science fiction writers than science fiction writers. They're actually using the same terminology because they can't come up with anything better. <laughs> and they know we're familiar with it, so we'll understand <coughs> what they're talking about. It makes a lot more sense to us than strings and quarks and bosons and, and you know, we understand warp drive, don't we? We know what that means. <laughs> yeah. The Office of Biological and Physical Research at NASA says, not, this isn't a will be, matter can now be in two places at once. Objects can be particles and waves at the same time. The same object can exist at two destinations. So I'm currently also giving a le this lecture in Seattle tonight. <laughs> the bit that they don't add, which is the more obvious bit, is that two destinations can equally be read as two dimensions. 
it doesn't really matter. They're talking about creating the same object in different places or dimensions, There's destinations or dimensions. And this is really very interesting because if you think in terms of, of that as being a little bit like um, cut and paste on your computer, you know, you cut something and you paste it somewhere else, that's what that is. But they're now talking about copying and pasting. Think about that. You copy a physical form of something and you go paste, 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 you put it in as many places as you want. Now this is strange type cloning, but it's a rather odd form of closing because it seems that when you trigger off the field in the original object, the others disappear. That's the theory, they disappear. So you're not really cloning, you're creating a situation whereby for the period of time necessary for the job in hand, you can put that object somewhere else. You wouldn't have to send a bomber to Iraq. You can clone the one that's standing over there to be there. It's a very interesting concept, the way that they're going now. They're taking away the need for travel while at the same time working on how we can travel faster. So it's kind of contradictory. And it'll be interesting to see which gets there first in each, each occasion. You can move this stuff in frequencies. It's how the fuel cells probably will ultimately work. And imagine an aircraft powered with fuel cells that can move in frequencies, like a radio band turning up the knob and off it goes. And you turn the knob and it stops. It can't fall down. It's in a frequency. You just stay there. You can't go anywhere. And they say, this is wonderful. This is a great concept. Um, actually, it gets away with um, our problems of taking off and landing, doesn't it? Because they're actually, in terms of a, you know, aircraft accident, they're the, 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 the difficult bits. They're the medieval bits. Bang, crash, up we go. Let's see if we can get off the ground and land it without bursting a tire. Now we don't have to have that, they say, because we can just leave airplane in a frequency. Well, that's okay. How do you get the people up and down? That's what they're working on. You don't bring the plane down to the ground, you take the people to the plane. Except, as I said before, when they've actually got there, we won't need planes because we can travel in our own frequencies. We don't actually need to huddle together in our boxes to do it. We can go where we like. Matter can be in two places at once, they say. Quantum entanglement allows two particles to behave as one, no matter how far apart they are. University of Vienna, trillions of molecules, light years apart, they've linked up. Quite incredibly, they can actually send anything they want between them in terms of, of, of digital mechanism, but that will be physical mechanism in time. So it's hardly surprising, really, that, that all of this stuff is now moving to the forefront of research, and I don't know where we go from here, but let's see what we have there. Oh, it's, uh, oh that's good, a bit of enterprise stuff. Yeah, that's good. Okay, okay. NASA statement again. Um, an ideal interstellar propulsion system would be one to get us to the stars as quickly and comfortably as possible as envisioned in science fiction in a vehicle without propellant that exceeds the speed of light. That's what they're after. Now think about the way this works and, and they try and explain the need for it. Our nearest neighboring star, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away. That's 4.2 years at the speed of light. That's our nearest star. We could never get to it. I mean, we're never going to, to be able to do that. The example that NASA give is this. The Voyager spacecraft left our um, atmosphere at 37,000 miles an hour. And at that speed, it would take it 87,000 years to get to that star. We couldn't do it. People will die, fuel will run out. It's impossible. 
unless we find a way to travel faster than light without traveling. That's what they're working on. Alcibiades' strange theory of 1994 has got them all running around in circles now, trying to beat each other with ways to make it work. The Ohio Aerospace Institute. I mean, all, all, all over America and certainly in Britain as well and parts of Europe, they're all working on this. The amount of link that is going on now between Britain and America is quite astonishing. British Aerospace and um, NASA, uh, Britain's um, uh, Ministry of Defence and America's Department of Defence, they might as well all be one unit now. They're working very, very closely, hand in hand on all this. And on Monday I'll be showing some of the projects that they're working on and the documentation for them. It's, it's what's beginning to tie us together um, as one in a way that, that we've never been really tied before at, at a government and military level. Something quite interesting that's come up just recently, although they, they sent this particular craft up in the air a long while back, a couple of years back, um, is something else called exotic matter, which they're also calling stardust. Stardust. And this is the stardust to stargate bit. Please, William. That's a, <coughs> a nebula there. Stardust is amazing. Stardust are microscopic grains, particles, um, up there in space. They exist in the farthest reaches we've been able to determine and they certainly exist in our own ionosphere and stratosphere. With all, within all types of cosmic dust, and there's a lot of cosmic dust up there, stardust comes as six particles within every hundred thousand particles of anything else. Six particles of every hundred thousand of what goes on up there are stardust. It's the stuff, they say, which came from a metal-rich supernova explosion. They say possibly even from the Big Bang itself, but whatever. But what they now know is that this material, this stardust, will hold the secret of organic life on this planet. They are absolutely convinced about this, and the reason is because they've been working with some already. I mean, it's not a, a new thing. They, they've gone up there to collect more. Um, it's interesting in that for all that they hold out its importance, they're a little baffled by the way it analyzes. Now, the analysis reports of Stardust are actually on the internet from NASA. You can get to them. Uh, lots and lots of pages of pretty boring technical stuff, but when you finally get down to the nub of it, we're only interested in what the analysis says this stuff is. And it says it's iron and silica and aluminum and a bit of oxygen. <laughs> it's the same stuff. These are monatomic elements of space dust, which they say holds the original secret of life on this planet, that it is responsible for life on this planet. So on that basis, it's not really surprising that its sister substance was so important and always has been so important. It's not surprising that our DNA reacts to it in the way that it does. It's not surprising that the light frequency within our DNA is identical to that within these elements and that they just link up and can flow light between themselves. They say that the interesting thing about stardust is that it's identical to um, certain deep seabed sediment particles and also they say stardust is found within 